Welcome back, guys, to the Bear and Scully podcast with me, Sean Scully, and a.k.a. Scully, old man, a.k.a. the Bear, Aiden, the face for radio behind the scenes, and today our guest is Victoria Bryan. Victoria, Thank welcome you. to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Pleasure to have you. Thank you. So, <laughs> Victoria, as we do with all our guests, we're going to get uh, go back to where you're from, yep. you grew up, and uh, in this podcast, we're going to cover alcoholism in, mm-hmm. in depth and the effect that it had on you. Yeah. Tell anybody out there that's suffering with alcoholism or is a family member that's dealing with someone, we're going to include links to help below. Um, and, you know, this will relate to a lot of people. Yeah. So it was important for us to, to get you up and, and, and have the podcast and create some awareness. But before yeah. we get to the series, well, we'll probably just go straight in, but where you grew up and, and where you went to school and find out some more. Yes, no problem. So um, I grew up in a little village called Carmoney, um, in Newton Abbey. And I grew up with my mum and my dad and I was an only child. Um, so, yeah, I, although things were difficult at home, um, my mum and dad really tried their best to give me everything that I needed. Um, my Mum and dad both had good jobs and um, they sent me to private school. You know, they were trying to give me everything that they could. Um, But unfortunately, that didn't really go to plan because our lives were just completely turned upside down from um, my father's alcoholism. Um, So... My dad was a drinker even before I was born. So I've lived with this my whole life. So that's basically where I've come from. And you, you didn't know any different? That you, you, you didn't know? No. And tell me, what's your earliest memory then when you're back? And did you ever... Because when you're a child and you don't know that that's not, mm-hmm. that's not the norm, you know? Yeah. I just remember, like I can... I've been thinking back to when I was a child and... You know, children are so, uh, they, they pick up on a lot more than what you think. You know, I can remember being really, really young, like four-ish, five-ish, and just knowing that there were days where my daddy wasn't himself. And he, you know, I could pick up on even his facial expressions, you know, that red face that he would get and his mannerisms and they were the times that I thought, oh no, I don't feel very safe right now in my dad's company. Um, but I think a lot of my really young kind of memories, I have to say there were some really lovely memories, you know, my dad's drinking didn't get extreme until a bit later on. So there was, you know, snippets of really lovely, happy, um, interaction with actions with my daddy. He was such a lovely, uh, kind, sensitive man. Um, really intelligent, extremely intelligent. So talented. Um, he would have always been wanting to teach me things and really good sense of humor. I can remember having the best fun with my dad in those times that he was really good so there was really happy times um but I think you know it definitely got it affected everything very early on in my life I can remember a lot of things just being kind of ruined by his alcoholism um you know whether that's you know family days out didn't happen or we, we never went on holidays we never you know, did days out or things like that. Um, so I definitely feel like I was affected really, really young. You know, would you would you class? I, I say class. Would you would you say that your dad was a functional alcoholic? So like going to work, yeah. coming home, but still had that drink problem. We'll say it is. Yeah. You know, during the day. Yeah. So he would have. Um, he would have been functioning for a certain period of time like he was drinking from he was you know in his teens and I don't know whether that's like a generational thing I've always tried to work this out why he started his drinking um and I don't know whether he grew up in you know Belfast in the troubles where things just weren't great you know it wasn't a happy time 
And I think that a lot of his stresses and mental health issues maybe started back then and that's where it started. And I think there was a huge uh, drinking culture then. That's all there really was to do. Everybody was just going to the pub or whatever. And then it became um, part of his coping mechanisms, you know, with stress, with work and things like that. And I think that's how it kind of snowballed, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone has this preconceived idea that people turn to alcohol or drugs or addiction after some big major event. And it's not always the way, no. you know, we, we try and pinpoint and, and, and maybe in, in the case, maybe it was something we don't know. But sometimes people think that that's the, the norm and this is the only way, but that it's not it's not that sometimes a culture and then yeah. other people become dependent on it. But when when you're young, your father was still in employment, and yes. and, and your mother was they, you both good jobs. You're going to school, and, mm -hmm. and then you realize started realizing things weren't right. Yeah, but was it what what type of guy was he then when he drank? Would he drink in the house, or would he go out and then and come back, or 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 what way did it change him? So it became, I don't know. My daddy was such a lovely person. And that's why it became such an issue because it was a Jacqueline Hyde drink drinker. You know, he would have been so sweet and lovely and nice, but alcohol turned him into something completely different. Um, he it, it made him violent. It made him verbally abusive. Um, I think that the when you're living with someone with addiction, it's they are doing everything they can to conceal what they're doing. You know, they're having to lie, they're having to do things. He would have drank in the house and he would have done anything to hide that. You know, you from the age, I can't, like really, really young, I would put my hand down the sofa and find all the alcohol bottles and tins and that was him trying to hide that. Um, so I think that's whenever he was maybe caught drinking or was asked about his drinking, it would have made him really, really angry because when you're confronting someone about something that they're trying to conceal and they can't live without, it does, it brings up a real anger within them. And that's that's why families are so affected by this because they're trying to save that person. They're trying to make sure that person's healthy and happy. But in their head, they are so... Um, you know, it just takes everything from them that that's all that they can focus on and that's all that they want, you know. I think a lot of people relate to that, that's in similar situations. Mm -hmm. You know, the same as what you're saying, hiding, drink around a house. Mm -hmm. Like I've heard so many different stories that, that that's a common thing. Mm -hmm. and it might not be around the house. It could be in the car. It could yeah, be it's in, in the garage and yeah, everything. Yeah. Go, going for a walk through a, a yep. forest and, yeah. and it's maybe a wee stash somewhere. Yeah. So like people will be listening to that and be relating to that and, yeah. and that. But that's that's just the life that they have. It's it. it's to try keep it concealed yeah. from everyone else, even mm -hmm. loved ones and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But from 20, 2023, last year, was the highest alcohol-related deaths mm -hmm. um, on record mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And that has risen by 46% mm -hmm. in this last 10 years. Yeah. So there's, there's obviously something has changed here. Yeah. And I don't know, I've just been thinking about it just because you were coming on. Mm -hmm. And massive part of that must have been COVID. Yes, it is, yeah. People being locked up in their house, mm -hmm. not fit to go and have a social drink. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, people that wouldn't have drank in the house. Yeah. All of a sudden, they had nowhere to go. Yes. So me and my wife, even over COVID, mm -hmm. having a stay in party. Yeah. And maybe FaceTiming Owen and his wife and yeah. having, oh, we'll have a few drinks. We'll have you on FaceTime. We'll have a bit of a party because we're not fit to socialize. Yeah. So that must have been a massive drive. Yes. Through COVID. Mm -hmm. People that wouldn't drink in the house. Now yes. all of a sudden sit in the house having a drink. That's right. And then the, there was no work. Mm -hmm. Nobody was going to work. Everybody was furloughed. Exactly. So it was okay to drink on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday because there was nothing to get up for the next day. That's right. And I don't mean going and getting hammered. It was maybe a, a glass of wine. Yeah. But... I have no doubt that that's been a massive, massive thing. Yeah. So did you find any of that there or was your... So this is why <clears> I <throat> this is why I really feel strongly now that I have to speak out. You know, this is something that I've lived with all my life and I felt 
really alone in it. I felt a lot of shame around it because it was such a stigmatized subject. You know, it's like a family secret when someone has an addiction within their family unit. You know, it's just, it's not something you want to tell everybody about. People feel a bit of shame about it. And this is why, as you say, that it's rising like this. This is not getting better. This is getting worse. And if I, I feel a responsibility now that, you know, I've come through such trauma and pain in relation to alcoholism and losing my father to alcohol use disorder and that's what it is it's a disorder it's a brain disease and if I'm speaking out about this and I'm ha- I'm being brave enough to you know let people know my experience I'm hoping that you know it opens up the conversation people don't feel the shame people aren't hiding what they're going through I'm hoping that children of alcoholics or family members of alcoholics see me speaking up and they can then feel empowered then to go and ask for help or confront the situation or kind of know what if there is any help out there what is that help you know I think we need to we really need to open this conversation up well I you know you said a statement there and we've had a similar statement being made by a person that lost their father till well it was suicide but he, he, he was struggling with alcoholism mm-hmm. and it created a lot of controversy mm-hmm. because and I don't I'm not saying one well, people are saying it's a disorder it's an addiction it's alcohol is a very funny one because it's not like we're a drug addiction where none of us take the drug yeah. and, and have a problem yeah alcohol we you know a lot of us might have a drink and socialize and that and that's where that ends yeah and so this is a different conversation some people don't understand alcoholism and, and no. I'm not saying I'm entirely uh aware of myself mm-hmm. i'm learning more as i go yeah it's only when i speak to people like yourself that have a, a, a clear insight of years of of the cycles of abuse and and that that they see the disorder and they see how it's, it's haunting the person but a lot of people ha- have a very uh, and this is what i think is the problem here is because we don't have a good understanding of addictions and addictions is a stigma in society so yes. it's swept away yeah you the, the I actually couldn't believe what Sean was saying there about the facts and 46%, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's one of the leading causes. And nobody's talking about it. Nobody wants to address it. Alcoholism is swept away for the simple reason is it's, it's, everyone wants to have a drink. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they don't want to address the problem what could be caused. So like, it's not the same. But I want to go back and ask you because sometimes when we're we're talking and, and like, it's lovely that you have such nice memories because sometimes what happens is when people lose a loved one to an addiction, we remember the death. Yes. We don't remember the life. Yes. So the good times, you know, when when he was teaching you and he, and he was loving you mm-hmm. and, and, and the good times, mm-hmm. it's great that that you're now in a place you, you, you're thinking of them. Yeah. But sometimes it's very, very hard for people that have lost people to, to uh, drugs or alcohol addiction to... To move past the death mm-hmm. and 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 remember the life That's because it. it's haunts them how it all finished out or or what happened. Yes, but the actual life and the, and the good memories. But there is also the other side of it, and it's a worse than all type of when we're making people aware of how hard it is. There was times as young you you said you didn't feel safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and how that was changing your father. What, what what when did you like what age was that and what was the, and you did say he was violent and I don't want to because I, I do want to move on till the thing but sometimes I think for people to realize that sometimes you see people drunk they're like oh they're cracking away and they think oh that's all that is and man they do yes with. but yes. there's a horror to it too oh there really is and this is another reason why I've really really got this passion now where I have to let all bear tell the truth about it, the good, the bad, the ugly about it, because I think as a society, you know, it's always been a thing of alcoholic. It's such a dirty word, you know, it's like that person, oh, he's an alco or, you know, that really awful way of speaking about someone. But I've seen it from, I was so young, right until I was 18 to the day he died, and there's just this such a misconception about people with alcohol use disorder. And it's, you know, that they don't care about people and they're, that's all they do. And, you know, they don't have any morals or whatever. And that is 
that couldn't be further from the truth from from what I experienced with my daddy you know it it starts off as something um as I say it could be social it could be a coping mechanism all it takes is for something huge to happen in your life it could happen to anybody and then that becomes a cycle of you know drinking a little bit more and a bit more and then that person becomes you know I've this is I'm 36 years old now and it's only now where I, because I've spent time really educating myself about why does a person become so addicted to alcohol and why does that person end up losing everything that they love knowing that they're losing it um and because I've educated myself the fact that you know it's a brain disorder when that person is drinking alcohol it releases all these you know dopamine and all these happy hormones and that's what that person's chasing but it also the more drink that you're taking in and the more it becomes a problem like your frontal lobe of your brain is being affected too and that's the part that it's your decision making you know it's that's why people aren't making good decisions all they can focus on it's like your brain is just flooded with this I need to get that feeling back you know and that's how it becomes completely over it just overtakes your body everything and I think that if people were more educated in why these people are you know struggling with that addiction struggling um to stop hurting their family members or acting in ways they would never act it's it's because they are not well they are very very ill and if we as a society can you know have more empathy for that and more understanding for that um and open up the conversation of yes the person with the addiction but also the family members and the people around that are affected by that and everybody's able to talk openly about it then hopefully we get more help in we get more um there's a community there of people that can relate to each other because I felt very, very alone. There was n- I knew nobody in my position. I was like, I'm the only person with my, my daddy that acts like this. And it's only in the past, I would say, three, four years where I found um, NACOA, which is a na- the National Association of Children of Alcoholics, never knew existed and then as soon as I found them there was just this community of thousands of people that were sharing their stories their experiences and I was like oh my god I'm not alone I this is a huge problem and it's happening to so many children and every time I heard them say I felt alone and I felt shame and I felt like I couldn't tell anybody about it it was a huge family secret I was like, and this is why this is a problem, because nobody is talking. And that's why I'm passionate now. I, we, we have to open up this conversation. Did you did you have a relationship with your father right up till 18? Because I, I know it's very hard to live around somebody mm-hmm. that is an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And just from what I know myself, the person themselves isn't trying to hurt everybody around them. Yeah. But it tends to be the case. But they do, yeah. They tend to push everybody away not yeah. knowing that they're pushing everybody away yeah so there, there's a lot of people's going to listen saying that they're family members and it could be a mother or a father it could yes. be a sibling whatever it is but instead of them being hurt and hurt and hurt again yeah. and lies the lies that they will hear yeah they've had to remove themselves from the situation say oh, yeah. and cut all ties that's it so that they're not the one getting hurt all the time that's right did you have a relationship up Till your dad passing or was so there... So this is the, the the parts of, you know, where you have to be brutally honest. You know, it's not nice talking about your father doing things to you that weren't good or, you know, because I, you know, you still want to protect them in a way. You don't want people to think bad of them. But I always have to remember that was my daddy and, you know, in a very, very ill place. But my dad really put me in some really awful traumatic situations um you know he you know there was times where from I was no age finding his drink bottles and pouring them down the sink just praying that you know if I get rid of this then he'll not drink and as a child that's that's traumatic you know that's that's like a role reversal that's like me you know mother and my my father if you know what I mean and trying to um, keep him safe 
Um, and then him becoming verbally abusive. Um, there were times of um, physical abuse. There was, you know, if I, I remember hiding his wallet so that he couldn't go to the, the off license to buy alcohol. And he became uh, physically abusive with that. Um, and then there was times where he put me in just complete danger. Um, as it, as the alcoholism got worse and worse and worse, and he just could not control any of it. Um, after my mum and him separated, you know, I would have seen him at weekends and a lot of the times he wouldn't have shown up. I would have been sitting on the, you know, in the porch waiting and he just wouldn't turn up because he was drunk or whatever. And they're, they're the things that shape you as an adult, you know, they're the things that, you know, instill a lot of um, hurt and um, anxiety within you. Um, but then on the times that he would have spent time with me, um, he he wasn't able to look after me. You know, I was a child and he was drunk. There was, t there was a time where he picked me up um, and driving, you know, driving drunk. Um, and he told me that he was taking me to the zoo. And I was so excited. I was going to the zoo with my daddy and this was great. And he took me to Belfast Zoo car park and we just sat in the car park and he drank six cans of beer while I sat in the back and he was like can you let can you hear any animals and you know they're they're the things that are stuck in my brain now and as an adult myself and as a mother myself now and I'm wondering how could he have done those things to me that are so awful and painful um but I've had to educate myself as into he was not in control of what he was doing you know Sometimes there's a great deal of anger when we look back at things like that. And, mm -hmm. and I know it's hard for you to say the things because you're worried of the judgment that pass and you think, but there's nobody's going to be listening to this and, and, and thinking like that. Well, the maybe, but what I mean is, you know, it, it, we, we know from addictions, it's not all rainbows and there's yeah. times that that there and, and, you know, it's good that you have that resolution, but what age were you then when your father passed? Were you 18? I was 18. And whenever he passed away, the question you asked there, you know, did you have a relationship with your father? As a teen, I still idolised him and I still loved being in his company, even though I knew, you know, I was probably going to be um, put in really awful situations. I still wanted that real closeness from my daddy. I still loved him and I knew he loved me because there was little snippets of time where maybe if he had sobered up a bit and I remember sitting and I'm just looking at me and the tears rolling down his face and I'm going, I'm so sorry. You know, he knew what he was doing when he was sobering up a bit, you know, and he and I could see he didn't want to do those things. But I think the older you get and you start to get your own mind, I then started to see that that was not good for me being in his company so I maybe wouldn't have seen him as much or if I had phoned him and said oh I'm going to come and I would have heard him on the phone being drunk then I would have been like no I cannot go or but then just as things got really really awful for him that breaks my heart because you know I lived with a lot of a lot of guilt over this and I really shouldn't have but just before he passed away, I went to see him and he had lost everything by this stage. You know, he he was living in a um, like a wee council house and he was um, he had pawned everything out of the house. There wasn't nothing, anything that wasn't nailed down was sold for drink and he didn't have any teeth. And he was just he just looked like he just looked so awful and. I remember going to see him and I think I had started college or something at that stage and I just remember looking at him and I just said to him and I was I think it was about 17 at this stage and I remember just saying to him I'm not coming back here until you sort yourself out get yourself sorted and he was all slumped over and I knew he wasn't listening and I just said to, and, I, and I remember saying to mum I can't I can't go back there and see that again until he sobers up and then about two months later he died and that's, 
that live that I think that's why I've struggled so much. It's that guilt of I couldn't save him, even though it wasn't up to me to save him. I uh, people after the death of someone with addiction still live with that. Like I wish I could have saved him. What what would it have been? And especially as a child of an alcoholic, you feel um this sense of was I not good enough? Did he not love me enough to stop drinking for me? Like I've begged him. I've begged and begged and begged and he still wouldn't stop. And I think that's I think that's why I have to speak out now because I've lived with that for so long and it's affected every part of my adulthood. And I, I want people to to hear this and see that even after even all that trauma, once they die it doesn't stop. It continues. And it's actually worse because you've got, you've got all these what ifs, you know. So. That, you know, there's so many people that say the same thing. Why wasn't it enough? Why weren't we enough? Why? That this is this is the level of understanding addiction. Mm-hmm. That it's if love could save people, so many would be saved. Mm-hmm. That's not. And this is this is why it's so hard to understand addiction. Yeah. When the people aren't, they're not thinking clear. They're not. They they become so dependent mm-hmm. that they can't actually see rational. No. They only see the the dependent. They only see what their addiction is, whatever it's drugs, whatever it's drink, whatever it is. That's mm-hmm. that's their soul becomes their sole focus, and everything becomes secondary. And as Sean says, the level of hurt that comes around it. But so many people then end up with with these questions yeah and and and, and it, it takes a lot of work but like you know and i know you say you get no but when you shouldn't you've done you've you've loved them you've done everything you mm-hmm. can but sometimes you just can't help them and that's the yeah that's the biggest hurt that there is because yeah. you just couldn't help but you 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 you's obviously you, your relationship broke down and it has two months but uh, your father passed away and and it was it was a bit of time before people had knew. Yeah. How long? You know, I know you're coming to terms with us now. Mm-hmm. Yes. But at the time, were you angry? Were you? Were you? Yes. I. Do you know it was? I felt such anger because I knew the type of man that my dad was, and my dad passed away with nothing. He at that stage. He pushed everybody out. He wasn't even answering the door to anybody. He wasn't, he didn't want anybody around him. It's like, the only way I can kind of describe it is, you know, when an an animal knows they're going to die and they want to go away and die somewhere quiet. And I genuinely feel like that's what happened to my daddy. And um, when daddy died, he wasn't found for, I think they said it was over a week. So he had been lying alone, um... And that's the bit that haunts me because nobody, nobody should ever die alone and they shouldn't be left. You know, that I've, I've been haunted by that image for so long, you know. Um, but I felt such anger and I think that's what I felt throughout my adult life um, was this real deep, deep anger that this shouldn't have happened to someone as amazing as him. And it shouldn't happen to anybody else. And I felt real resentment um, because I'm like, what is it going to take for people with this problem and this illness? What's it going to take to really, really help them? You know, and I don't want anybody uh, to ever experience what I've been through or what my daddy's been through without feeling that they have somewhere to go or some help of some sort. Do you, do you think with your dad's passing, there's a realization there that it is an addiction, and like yeah. before, people people will say that oh he's going to be found dead sometime. Yes, but you don't think it's ever going to happen. No, like that comment would be said a lot of times yep. to alcoholics. Um, there's going to be some day we're just going to find them dead. Yeah, and you still always think oh, the love that I've given them that's yeah. going to make them stop. Exactly, and it's only whenever they're passing. Yeah, and then you start thinking back. You're like. It has went to this point. Yes, exactly. They're no longer with us anymore. That's right. So it was an addiction. Yes. You, there's like a realization that yes. they couldn't do anything to help themselves. No. How was I ever going to try and help them? Yeah. Y- you know, that sort of way. Yeah, that's but it. is that how you feel at the minute after your dad p- 
passing. Yeah. So I have a real, um, because I've spent so, I've worked so hard um, and being proactive about educating myself, as I say, um, I've had to work on my mental health my whole life because of this. And it's being proactive and really um, seeing it for what it is. Now, while it, in my 20s or whatever, I didn't have the understanding. I was extremely angry with him for a long, long time. Um, you know, why did you leave me? And I couldn't understand who I was as a person either. I was like, why am I like this? Why do I feel the way I do? Why, why can I not function the way other people are functioning? But I was living with deep trauma and I couldn't see that as trauma. I just seen that as that's the way I was brought up. This is normal. But it was trauma. And then that um, trauma spilled out into different aspects of my life, whether it would have been um, difficulties maintaining relationships. You know, I've lived with an anxiety disorder. I had my first uh, panic attack when I was eight. I was hospitalised when I was eight years old with a panic attack, and it was due to my dad's drinking. My mum would even tell you that. Um, living with that real anxious feeling you know I was just always so anxious as a child because of him and you know I've had to work so hard on everything so I've got to a point in my life now and I think whenever I became a mum I think that really resonated a lot with me because the love I have for my kids I would do I would do anything for them and I know my dad felt that way for me. I know it because I felt love from him in those snippets of time that he was well. Um, and he was a smart guy. It wasn't as if, you know, he didn't have the intelligence. And then I knew, I was like, that man just could not control that. And then once I found that inner peace of knowing that he couldn't have controlled any of this, that's whenever I started to feel peace as well with it. And I was able to look back on it, not feeling that real painful feeling. And I think once I became um, the member of uh, NACOA um, and I was, you know, chatting with people in my same situation, I didn't feel alone. I think that's whenever I was healing a lot from it as well. So it, it, it is in the understanding of addictions, there is healing mm -hmm. because then you start saying that's why. That it's nothing to do with me. Yep. Not even them. They just couldn't get out of it. Yeah. And it does. I know it helps some people. It helps get rid of that anger. It helps you allow you to see the good times. Because I'm sure in, yeah. in, in, in the immediate aftermath, you're 18, 19, you've lost your father, and then you're full of rage. Yeah. You're not seeing any of the good times. No. It's only when you've went on this. But did you, did you receive help? Did you speak to somebody, uh, you know, is this all self-care that you've started to come to terms with and, and researching it or ha had you actually went and spoke to somebody? So I've done a lot of um, CBT. I've done CBT, which I find really helpful because that's a kind of, you know, you need to work on that. You know, you go home with a bit of homework and things and you have to really start, you know, working on um how you manage your thought processes and it's changing your thought processes about it. So I've done a lot of that. I've done the talking therapies. Um, but I'll be honest, see, the, the, the biggest thing that has helped me through this, and it's only recently, as I say, so I've spent all this time suffering from, you know, different issues. Um, but the biggest thing was seeing other people speak out about it and that this is why I'm here today because I... I feel a responsibility that I, I've got so much help from seeing other people being brave enough to open up that conversation and see once I seen others saying the exact same things as me. Honestly, that was my biggest, the biggest thing that's helped me. And I feel so much um, peace with that as well, because I feel like I'm not alone, you know. And and I get that because in through that and and. When you have so many things that have happened like that there and you, you can't process it and you don't know what's different about you. You don't know why you're feeling different. Mm -hmm. And then you, you hear somebody else say, and you're like, well, their story's not much different than mine. Yeah. And that happened to you too. Did you feel like that too? Yeah. And and there there, there is a sense of vindication that, that, that 
you know, I'm not the only person that has felt like this or gone through this, yeah. and, and they can talk to somebody and, and see how it affect them. Yeah. And, and I think that's very. I do. I, I I didn't understand so much the importance. I do know there is uh, friends that alcohol anonymous the family of yeah and and they, they I, I only became aware of that speaking to deirdre but now speaking to yourself i didn't know about nicole but it, yeah. it's a group of, of ones coming together that uh, children that, uh, and you you don't have to be a child now no it's mostly adults now yeah, yeah it's mostly so, adults within that but they have like a free phone service for you know children if they feel um that their parent is drinking too much. They're trying to raise all the awareness. They're going to schools, they're going. And I think that's a huge thing. We need to be um, making this an open topic. Even in schools, you know, you think about it, the teachers are the ones that are seeing those kids five days a week. And if a child's going in after, they're maybe scared to go home because of their parents drinking or they've had a horrible weekend from their parents drinking and they're going into school. Because I certainly felt that I couldn't tell a teacher. Um, but I think that came from the shame and it being a secret, you know. The We spoke, we haven't spoke, but how how did this affect, and I know I'm asking you to speak on behalf of your mother, but how did this affect your mother trying to, to bring you up, shield you from this and, mm-hmm. and, and deal with an alcoholic husband and... How, how did that affect her? Oh, my goodness. I don't know how she did it. I really don't. I think the problem is with um, it being in, you know, a marriage. You know, you've got your marriage and then there's all this, there's all the lies, there's all the deceit, there's all the financial issues that come with alcoholism. You know, there was times where we were left with not a penny because my dad was spent on alcohol um so my mom's trying to manage a home her job and she's got a child and I my heart goes out to any wife or husband or partner or whatever um that is trying to manage all of that because when you think about it that person isn't able to manage all the things to do with life in general they don't have that capacity because they're so ill with the the addiction so they're trying to get through so much. And I know my mum, like, I have so much respect for her because she always, she does say to me sometimes, you know, I just, I shouldn't have stayed for so long. And I'm sorry I stayed for so long. And I'm like, mum, no, because you were trying to just keep a family and you were thinking that things were getting better and then you would go back and, you know, and it's such a long process. And I would say that to people, um, maybe listening to this, if they're in, that situation, you know, it is so hard to get it right. You don't know what is what to do that is right for your family when it comes to that because you are trying to keep everything together. But please just try to get help yourself because my mum went through this all on her own and I wish that she had more help and she didn't have to feel that it was a secret, you know. Throughout all that, your dad's drinking, did he ever go and seek any help? Yeah, he went to AA. I think he, he went to AA. Um, and he did. He did quite well for a while. I'm not sure what age he went or I can't, I can't remember much about it. I just know from my mum telling me he did go to AA. So there was that in him that he knew that he needed help and he did admit at one point that he needed help. But that's just something that he didn't maintain and that is that happens you know there is some people and it's amazing it can work for you you know with the right help it can work for you um but unfortunately if that person just doesn't want that help it's hard to get through you know you can't force somebody to go you can't you aren't going to be that you can't make that decision for them they have to make that on their own 100 percent. if it was the will that everyone else had they would be fine. Exactly. But mm-hmm. if they don't want the help for themselves, mm-hmm. then it's a waste of time. That's it. That's it. And also then, it's hope. builds hope up in you that, yeah. you know, and if they don't want that and they, 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 they're they not going to go through that, they, mm-hmm. you know, they're building hope up in the people around them, but they know they're not, they have no intention of, of sticking to it. Yeah, that's, that's it. Hard. Now, we're now, when you become a mother, mm-hmm. and I know for some people, it changes your mindset. Yeah, 
and and you see things differently. Yeah. Did becoming a mum help you repair your your? I know you you, you can't repair your father's not here, but yeah. within yourself, that peace. Yeah. Did it help, or did it did it make you did it flare up a wee bit of anger? Because I know when you become a mother and you realize what you're ready to sacrifice, you're like, why can't they do it? Sometimes we must place this thinking, the love. Yeah. If the love's enough, and 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 that and creates rage because you're like. I would do anything. Yes. Why couldn't I do this one yes. thing? And it's very hard to understand addiction when you're that. But what did it change the way, or did it take a bit of work? It did take a bit of work. I remember being quite triggered whenever I became a mum. I remember just thinking. I remember I I've I've been upset and angry that he's not here to see his grandchildren for a start. You know, they're the things that you know life goes on after they they are not here anymore and. Things happen in your life and you're like, oh, I wish he was here to see this, you know, or you have your children and they they would have been their grandfather or grandmother or whatever. And, you know, I felt real resentment inside and that was something, there's always a trigger, you know, there's triggers throughout that will just remind you of what happened and remind you of the things they're missing or whatever. And I was extremely triggered whenever I had my firstborn, um, Amelia. I just remember looking at her going, like, I would do anything to keep you safe. And, you know, there's no way I could do the things that my daddy did to me, to you. Um, I would move mountains to, you know, to keep you safe. And that, oh, this is what the love feels like as a parent. Oh, you know. Um, so I had, I've had to really be proactive in making sure that that hasn't been detrimental to me because I have to be healthy for to be a mum so it's like constantly working um through your mental health and through uh things that trigger you and knowing when things trigger you and going right that's that's not a, a healthy way of thinking about that I have to change how I think about that so that I feel empowered or if I, I feel more peace with that so it, it shows you that no matter what throughout your life even after they've gone there's, it's still going to trigger you, you know. You still have to work at it. The hardest thing to work out in that is he didn't love you any less than you love yours. Yeah, that's it. This is the hardest thing with addictions. And I know yeah. some people have so sat in their mind and they're like, oh, selfish or that's that, and that's not, that. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't mean that they loved you less. No. They just couldn't handle their, their life the way it was. Yeah. And... That's a very, very hard thing to come to terms with. Yeah. Like when you're looking at that and you get angry and, and you have your child and you're like, oh, how much I know, I would never do that. Mm -hmm. In the right frame of mind, your father would never do that either. No, I And know. that's the hard thing in, in sometimes this. And, and it's a good thing that we're having this conversation. And there is triggers and there's things you've said that are, are close to home that you won't realize even. Yeah. I, I haven't said this, but uh, my, my father's brother, my uncle, uh, had a serious alcohol addiction and it he died alone and it was a while before he was found and, yeah, and there's anger in you're sad there's an immediate it's, it's, it's a sad thing because you're straight away thinking to yourself how sad it is their life become that there, there was nobody even knew mm -hmm. but it's very hard in addictions to not look at the death to yeah. look at the life and that's the one thing that, uh, you know, speaking to you, and I'm glad you're at that stage. There's a lot of people who won't be at that stage mm -hmm. now. I know. People will be at the anger stage or different cycles. And there'll be waves. There'll be times you get angry again. Yeah. Why are you not here? Like, your father was 48. Did, 47. Yeah. 47. Young man. He didn't see his 50. Like no. that, you know, and, and, and like, as you say, life's been, so much has been robbed. Memories for you, your grandchildren. There's so many things that have been taken away. Yes. But people will be in different cycles here, but... I think it is very important when we're, 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 we're talking about the positive and, and, and there's help for people there is. to talk to other people mm -hmm. that have experienced yours to try and mend that. I say mend the relationship because you are mending the relationship even though they're not here. Yes. When you can start seeing the life, the good times, the That's times it. you want to teach you and, 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 and the love that you felt as opposed to just the anger and the end. Yes, that's it. And, Definitely. And, and I think... It's important for us, to, and we're talking to people, that if you're angry, 
and and you become angry because you, you'd only become angry because you loved them. That's it. You yeah. wouldn't be angry and triggered if you had no feelings for them. Totally. So yeah. for people in a different cycle in this, mm -hmm. I hope that they do reach out to them groups or speak to people that have a similar or speak to somebody. Yes. Because you can't consume that anger no. that you have for somebody. You need to make some sort of resolution. Yeah. You need to have some sort of this is, you know, this is why. And I'm, if you, I think massively what you've said to me, and, and, and I have learned this from others, is when you start to read about addictions and understand it properly, not have the social media idea of that selfish, that's the way they are. No. Have a proper, true understanding of what that is. Yeah. It helps resolve some of the... It does. It, it, and, and CBT uh, lets you see things very clear in, in, in the mindset. But it, it puts a lot of light back into yourself when you're starting to understand that. You have to have start it. questioning a lot of things. And yeah. So for some people, I hope they do reach out. And I hope they look at that, and I hope they, they they get some comfort from this because it is a very stig it's a very stigma. Yeah, like, it is. We still to this day. It, our culture mm -hmm. is here. Like yeah. sometimes there's there there's a town and 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 at one point there was more pubs than people registered in. Uh -huh. Like it it's it's our culture. Yeah. It it's you know people don't want to talk about it because they enjoy having a drink. And exactly. It, it, yeah. Yeah, that means it stops, but that's not that's, that's not not, not yeah. what we're having yeah. the conversation for. That's it. You know, and like when you're talking about that, as you said, sometimes you don't want to say the bad things because the thing, but. We, we have to do it worse than all because them, the, the wee things you say is what resonates that's to the people it. that are actually going through that. They're yeah. like, that's happened to me. I've that's been put right. in that position too. Yeah. You know, they're the things that sort of, and you'll find that in that group, they're the things that are unifying people. Definitely. That didn't just happen to me. But no, it, look, I, as, as I said, it's cut closer to the bone than you were, mm. which will also mean it'll cut closer to the bone to other people. Yeah. yeah. There will be people there and maybe they haven't lost part. Maybe they're they're still in that hope cycle that they're hoping they're going to save them. Yeah. But sometimes you have to do the separation too. Yeah, you the do. Self preservation. Self preservation, definitely. Because if they're pulling the pin on the grenade, there doesn't need to be two people in there. You know. Uh, exactly. Yeah, and that's what I did. That's what I did. Unfortunately, it didn't work out the way that I hoped for, but I still believe that I made the right decision because I would have been for another two months being traumatized, you know? And it's th another thing that sort of came into my head, I'm like, would I have wanted my daddy to live any longer than what he did but in that awful, awful, horrific place that he was in? And it's awful to say, but no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want him to suffer any, he battled and he suffered for so long. And that's the, the that's the hard truth of it. No, I wouldn't want them to suffer anymore, you know, and I wouldn't want him to cause me any more pain or the, everybody around him that's trying to help him. But at the same time, I, I still look back and I'm like, what can I do here? You know, I'm, I'm the one still here. I'm the one that has to be healthy and happy for my kids, for myself as well. And I feel really strongly now that I'm in a place where I feel comfortable and I feel brave enough where I want to open this conversation up and I hope it really I really really hope that it does I think people that are listening to this I hope that they can see that it's a very stigmatized thing still to this day even in a country like this where there is a lot of it going on and for it to move forward and for people to be getting help that they need we have to make it a topic that isn't stigmatized and is very open and honest. People will then have empathy for it. They'll see it for what it is, the, the illness. They'll see that it's just a human being behind that illness that has had things happen in their life that we don't know and maybe never will know. And they also have a past, but they're also a human being. And society shouldn't cast those people aside just because of the way they're acting under the influence of alcohol. There's a story behind there. And I'm hoping that uh, that opens that conversation. So, Well, I, I think you're very brave. And I know it's not easy. And it's a very hard balance when you're trying to deliver a message and you don't want to soil your dad's name completely. No. But you can't tell 
the half the picture without all the picture and 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 yeah. and, and so I, I, look i want to thank you first and foremost for for kickstarting that conversation coming on because i think it's brave of you I, you i i i know it's hard because we have people come on here and they want to tell their version of a truth because it, they don't want to but that doesn't work because people need to know and 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 people that are truly going through this with the family will know the words that's involved in it and yeah. that's what resonate with people and yes. and i want to thank you very much for coming up and the one thing is there something you want to finish is there any advice you'd want to give to somebody that that's either in the midst of that or they've lost is there anything that you would like to say or or, or? um i would definitely like to get across that um you have to separate yourself from that person's addiction that's what i've had to do you know you feel this um you know responsibility to save that person and you have to make it clear in your head if that person doesn't want the help and you are badgering and bad and you're like please and begging and begging and if that person doesn't want the help there comes a point where you have to think of yourself you have to look after yourself because I know I didn't look after myself and I've spent a very long time recovering and suffering and I don't want that to happen to people. I really hope that people um, listening to this can see that, yes, there is hope for people. People are recovering. I've seen it. You know, people can get help. If they're getting the help and professional help, then there is, there is hope for people. Um, but I would say you have to... Make, a, make sure you're keeping yourself healthy, you know, and asking for help from other people, reaching out to other people. Don't be afraid to discuss it with people that you trust and you're happy, you feel comfortable um, talking to your best friends or your family or whatever. Just try to get those words out because I've held those words in for a long time and I think that's what was bubbling within me. Um, and it was a bit too late at some stage because I went through a lot. Um, but I, f I think if earlier on, if I had been able to talk to people, then I think I would have maybe been able to heal a bit quicker. So I'm hoping that people really feel that they're not, I hope they feel they're not alone because they really, really aren't. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Victoria. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>